what you're going to see is a bit more in depth of what the slush fund is. So when you're talking about the economy and the environment, when you're talking about balancing nature with um, material needs and with business, what we're trying to achieve with the slush fund is that new model. Um, and it's quite ambitious. We've got the experience of where we're getting our ingredients from. We think organic practices are very good. Um, we think that fair trade is very good. You know, they're, they're all admirable things to be doing. Actually, though, what we want to do is go beyond that. So it's not just about um, it's not just about paying a fair wage. It's not just about making sure that um, we're not using a few pesticides. Actually, it's a, a holistic vision which takes everything that we want to be doing and creates something that is beyond buying, basically. So that's what we're trying to do with the slush fund. So we're very excited today, and what we would like to do is welcome you to the world of the slush fund. So it would be nice if maybe Paolo and Paul could maybe talk us through what permaculture is and why we've chosen to kind of hang our hat a little bit on this ecological agricultural model and permaculture in particular. You all right with that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> the word permaculture, what it, what it is, is a contraction of two words, permanent and agriculture. And it's based on the observation that what we've been doing for the last several hundreds of years is using an agriculture that is degrading our land and our soils and then just moving on to some new nature and chopping that down. And we recognize that if we keep doing that, we can't keep doing that. We're going to run out of land. We're going to run out of soil. We're going to run out of water. So it's aiming at having an agriculture that is stable enough to be permanent. And to do this, um, the only real way possible is to use the same type of models and functions that you see in nature. So when people talk about ecological agriculture, it's a form of agriculture that has lots of biodiversity, lots of beneficial interconnections between elements, not just one big field of one thing and another big field of another thing. I won't go into the detail of all that too much. Essentially, this vision has been in direct competition with big industrial agriculture that wants to basically make as much money as possible at the expense of everything else. So it hasn't really been very well represented in, in, um, in academia, in our universities, uh, or in the business world. But it is a global movement with hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people involved with it. And whether you have the permaculture label on it or not, um, it's very similar to what a lot of traditional um, indigenous styles of agriculture were. So using lots of trees in the growing system, lots of agroforestry. And at its core, one of the things that makes permaculture different is that um, it's, it's, it's a system of ecological design. So for designing the growing systems, the farming, but also where people live, the buildings, um, the energy systems, and integrating it all together based on three ethics. Okay. You can boil down all, all ethics that you can think of, you know, anything that we think of might be a good idea, basically into these three ethics. And the first one is care of the earth. If we don't look after the earth, we haven't got anything. The second one is care of people. We need to look after each other because otherwise we breed conflict, we have inequality, and all of the wonderful things that come from that. And then the third one, earth care, people care, the third one is fair share. And the idea of that is that from the proceeds of what we get from our work, we should reinvest a good chunk of the surplus back into care of the earth and care of people, not into million dollar bonuses and yachts for the guy who owns the company. So that's, that's the kind of the underpinning of permaculture. And I, when I first heard about what Simon and Lee were interested in doing with the slush fund, I thought that that resonates and fits very well with Lush's core values as well. So there's a kind of compatibility there. What I also want to add to what um, Polo has said, um, uh, permaculture is also community development. Uh, what we know is that um, we have to create businesses in our communities. Where we have a lot of businesses in the community, that makes the community sustainable. But we always say that uh, if um, 
you have a family and then uh, you have five children. And then four of the children are poor and one person is a rich man. You are all poor. But uh, if there is a family of five and then uh, one is poor and then the four are rich, you are all rich. So permaculture is a community development so that we can create a lot of businesses. So our money in the community can circulate for quite a long time before the money can live in the community. That makes the community sustainable. And also how we can also recycle our waste into a resource. And it's also our way of life. The way we behave, the way we interact with our people, the way we work, the way we share our resources, and also the way we also interact with the people. So that is all about um, permaculture. Thank you. And just one, one more thing. What, what Paul touched on is how perma, permaculture doesn't just mean permanent agriculture. If you take it to its more logical conclusion, it's permanent culture. We can't have a permanent culture unless we resolve these, these issues of social injustice and environmental degradation. So the two very much go together. So as you can already see, it's quite a large, it, it covers quite a large area. So instead of approaching you know, a community saying, we're just going to pay you better for what you do, you have to then start to ask, what are you doing? And what environmental practices are you, are you practicing? And it, it asks more and more questions. And so it's, as Paolo is saying, it's an intricate web, really. It's more complex. But in the end, it's more rewarding for everybody because you get the best of, you know, if it's done intelligently, um, you get the best of, of all of it, really. So I really, for me, when I started to hear these things, I was like, that would be incredible if we could... Crazy ideas. They're, yeah, a lot of, yeah, a lot of it's crazy. Um, but if but we listen to me, incorporate it into buying, I, I don't know why I listened to you, to be honest. If I'm, you know, going back, it didn't make that much sense, but... But if you incorporate it into buying, if you incorporate it into where your ingredients come from, it could, you know, it could be something quite fantastic. And, and so that's kind of where we started. And actually, one of the first things that we, we supported was um, Peace Cocoa doing that. So I think everyone knows the story of the Peace Cocoa Butter and how we brought that from Colombia and, and the peace community there. That was kind of the starting point. That was our first crazy experiment with... Um, this kind of activity, and then we've developed it from from there. Really, this is a, an example of um, of kind of permaculture in action. It looks like a lot of green. It's it's called alley cropping. Yeah, Just it's so. a polyculture system. As you can see, instead of a monoculture, you get a polyculture, and what that means is instead of just um, if everyone remembers the palm oil. And the fact that we don't want to buy palm oil anymore because of the fact that you have to cut down the rainforest and what you end up with is a monoculture system. This is the answer to that. It's, um, and these guys, we're gonna, I think you're going to talk more about it in Paul's presentation. And as we go, kind of ways of answering that question of, okay, if you're not going to do monoculture, what's that, what's that going to look like? But one of the things that we're also quite keen on is making sure the money works and that the money flows through the system very much like Paul was saying that we can sustain our business and uh, everybody's income and jobs at the same time as creating new jobs and that the money can then flow through that system a bit like water would instead of privatizing it. After you, Lee. Thank you. So when we, when we talk about sustainability, we often naturally flow towards the social and environmental sides, but actually, uh, economical and financial sustainability is massively important, especially if a lot of these projects are, are to work in the long term, if they're going to survive and thrive. So if we have a look on the screens, there's a model there, and that's, that's not always, but what a conventional model of share of income or profit through a supply chain might look like. And you can see you've got the farmer and producer, you've got the agents and middlemen, the processors, the distributors. And actually, it's, it's easy to see how you could arrive at something like that with a lot of the grassroots producers not necessarily having access or the infrastructure to, to, to find buyers for the materials. And the flip side of that is buyers, so cosmetic companies like ourselves, not necessarily 
having the drive, ambition, or the skills to actually go and set things up and, and buy them. And, and we know this because, Simon, when you and Agnes are in the fields, we're pretty much, there's no one there, bar one or two others, there's really no one else out there. So we don't really like that model. It doesn't sound very fair. The slush model tries to do things slightly differently. So you'll see here there's no agents, but we don't need them because we've got a team of expert buyers who are experienced in, in setting up projects all over the world. Processing, well, we can do that ourselves. And distributors, in truth, we haven't used distributors uh, for some time now. It's, it's key to for us to understand all about the material, the quality, how it's made, uh, the labor conditions and the environmental impact surrounding the production of the material. So what is slush really in numbers terms and where does it come from? Well, it's funded by Lush Limited and the model is broadly we put 2% of our packaging and raw materials buying spend each year into this pot. So that might be about up to half a million quid. So far to date, what we've actually spent from this pot is 800,000. So it's a significant investment. There's some big numbers going in there. Um, mostly that's investments. So building a, a supply relationship, but there's other aspects too. So there's some development, there's some support to existing suppliers and, and something more of a donation in nature. And this is really the ideal financial model that we try to work from. So if you can imagine, you've got the slush fund, and that invests in projects around the world. And that would typically mean infrastructure, wages, machinery. The project would then supply into Lush, supply materials, and hopefully generate a profit from that. And that's, that's not unreasonable to expect, given what we've talked about in cutting out the different stages of middlemen and agents, etc and how we'd look to then spend that profit in a variety of ways, but putting money back into the producing community. So that's the, that's the project there. Uh, repaying the slush investment and then funding future slush projects, so expanding. And you can see with that model there, the kind of way it flows through, it, it's sustainable in itself. And then the dream, if we kind of extrapolate that or expand that further, the dream model would then look something like this where you've got all these kind of projects and you're expanding and setting up all over the world. It's flowing back into the slush fund to the point where the slush itself becomes sustainable. And what I mean by that really is that lush is no longer required to fund that. It's self-financing and it continues you to grow and expand and expand. So just lastly, what are some of the principles of slush finance? So transparent, fair and stable pricing upfront payment where needed, no currency risk, so we'll always pay uh, the projects or suppliers in a currency of their choice. We don't believe in, in passing exposure down to them. No exclusivity, so really we're happy if, if some of the projects can find other buyers for the goods. We absolutely don't insist on exclusivity at all. And prices should be based on the cost to produce, and by that I mean by yields, weather conditions, production costs, wages. Um, and what I don't mean is things like flooding the market, withholding products, commodities, tax regimes, and that kind of thing. It should be based on real life, supply and demand. Um, and the last point really I'd like to make on this side of things, um, and the founders or the board might want to cover their ears at this point, but the, the slush is high risk. You know, it's a, it's, this is not a normal supply so our agreement that we've had, it, it's high risk, um, it's adventurous, and there's a lot of trial and error. Um, yeah, but we do, one of the best ways to manage that I've, is through building relationships and trust and going to see the project and, it's, and on the ground. Which It's high do. risk, but it's high trust. Yes. So we work with people who are in a network of integrity already. They've, Paul's been doing work for 15 years before I met him with no support and resources. So you kind of know from that that he's, he's not in it for the money. You know, he's in it for the right reasons. So these are people we can feel very confident about working with. And one, sorry, just one of the other things to say is that in the early days especially when we, so the first consignment of cocoa beans that cost us £50,000, we didn't actually tell anybody that's what we were doing. Um, Lee very kindly. Well, I told you. Yeah, <laughs> Lee very kindly supported us on this kind of high risk venture, and we were like, if it does get lost, we are going to get in quite a lot of trouble. Um, 
but actually it worked out fine. But without that initial support, we wouldn't have been able to get any of this going. So it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's a big thank you to Lee and his team for kind of, not, he didn't hide it, but he just didn't tell everyone straight away. <laughs> But, you know, it, we needed, it needs the financial support, you know, so it needs the business support. It needs everybody to be behind it and to take that risk, you know, as, as a group. And, and what forms then is a partnership. And um, in a moment, I think we'll, we'll see one of these partnerships in action with Paul and his projects. But uh, and the other thing I wanted to say as well, it is high risk. And, and that's also what makes it very pioneering because to be able to do what we've been doing, you, you need to have the support of a lot of people. You need people to understand what you're trying to achieve. It's not something that, well, I, don't, I can't think of any business doing this apart from us at the moment anyway. Uh, but, but it is very pioneering. It's adventurous. Um, it's not a common model. And we really are very fortunate that we have had the, the support of many people in the business. I'm looking at... Mark and Mo, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, very pioneering. So, Paul, if you'd like to tell us a bit about all the work, the hard work that you've been doing, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, in the beginning, we I registered Permaculture Network in Ghana, but our main aim was to be working with the grassroots farmers how we can link the farmers to market, and also um, uh, to be doing what we call um, value chain. But the value chain, what, what we said is that uh, we have the farmers who are producers, and we have processors, and then retailers, and then the whole goods reach the final consumer. We're asking ourselves that, oh, can't the farmers produce, process, retail, and then reach the final consumer? I was there one day when I checked my mail, I saw an email from Polo. And then he said, oh, I have visited your website from Australia Permaculture Institute. And you are doing incredible work. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to sponsor you to go to Germany. And then that is where I got to know Polo. And then I did some presentation over there. Finally, Polo and then Simon visited Ghana. And then um, when they visited Ghana, they visited some of my projects. So um, the farmers that we were working with them, growing Moringa, 7,000 farmers, um, I got a dream like, oh, why not these farmers processing Moringa into Moringa soap, Moringa cream, Moringa ointment, Moringa shampoo, Moringa liquid soap, so that we can sell in the community, so that we can get money from the community, and then people in the community can buy the product. So we started working on it, um, but the problem that we're having is that um, how to get a very big market for the product was another problem. So when Paulo and Simon came, we visited some of the farms and then the product that we are doing, and then Paulo said, oh, then Paul, what I can do is that I can develop a website for you. And then he developed the website, and now I can tell you that uh, we are now shipping tons of tons of Moringa outside the country of Ghana. Uh, we, are, we are shipping some to US, we are shipping some to Germany, and also um, uh, South Africa, Cote d'Ivoire, and also Burkina Faso. And again, uh, we got um, first funding from um, Lash. And then the first funding, I asked Polo and then Simon, that, oh, what can I use the first funding for? He said, anything that you want to use it for, you can use it for. And I said, oh, why not um, go into mushroom? registering of the Moringa Enterprise in Ghana. We also started establishing tree nursery, where we were collecting the indigenous trees, where we can also set up a nursery, and then uh, we can sell the trees, and then uh, we can also plant some of the trees just to control the environment and also get more income to develop some of the communities that we are working for. How many, how many trees have you got in those nurseries, um, The trees that we have uh, in some of our nurseries is uh, millions, millions of tree seedlings in the, in the nursery. Millions of tree seedlings. They are all indigenous trees. But what we know is that uh, when we have the trees, the trees are medicinal, and then trees are food. The trees also create a good habitat for the animals. It also improves the soil. It helps in the rainfall. 
it also reduces the carbon emission in the atmosphere. So the money that the people in the community are getting from the tree nursery, they are using it to, for, the, for, the, for the youth who are not able to go to school to get some school fees to further their education. And then also to supporting some of the women on the, um, uh, their health care, um, health insurance, to pay for their health insurance, and also some grinding machine in the community so that they can grind their meal, um, uh, their cereals, and then prepare a good meal for their family. Because in some part of Ghana, people grind their cereals on a stone, and it takes time. So um, uh, they have been using this money from the tree nursery to do all these things. And also, one thing that we also suggested that then why not creating businesses in the communities? So we started targeting women. People will ask us, why is it women? Because women do a lot of work at our home. Because before we get a food on our table, it's women who are going to do it. Before our children will go to school, it's women who takes care of them. So we decided that oh, why not getting businesses for women, giving them some small um, uh, loans. So giving them small loans is not something that we are looking for, but try to um, educate them on food and nutrition. Try to also educate them how they can save money. Try to educate them how they won't use their money to buy material things, but they will use their money on their children. They will use their money to support their husband. So um, giving them this money and then creating businesses in the community is, is just a period. So after the period, then what we are trying to do is that we are educating them on a saving, savings culture so that they can save money and then they won't borrow money from outside. They won't borrow money from bank. Because looking at it, the interest of the money from the bank is very high. And then we also decided working on the mushroom. The mushroom, um, we started gathering the sawdust. When you go to the sawmill, the sawdust are there, it's a waste. Then people start burning them. So we decided recycling the sawdust, making a compost. So when, I'm going to, when I started going to register the mushroom project in the municipal assembly, when I went there, the man told me that this guy is a mad person. Why are you gathering waste for mushroom? It's not possible. So the guy told me that uh, they should give me the certificate so that I should go away. So I shouldn't pay anything for it because they don't see the, the sense of me doing that. Because they don't see any profit that we are going to get from it. They don't see why mushrooms. So um, they give me the certificate and then we started working on the mushroom project as a training center where people are buying the mushroom bags, and then they are also doing mushroom cropping, and then people are also getting mushroom for their dinner. Because mushroom is very nutritious, and it's cheap to buy the mushroom to prepare your dinner, and it's also healthy. Because now what we have just found out that people who are having high blood pressure, people who are diabetic patients, they are now buying the mushrooms. That is the food that they are eating now. Those who are having a kidney failure, that is what the doctor has just prescribed for them to be taking. So this mushroom, all this project that we are doing over here, we were trying to see how maybe uh, Ghana Permaculture Institute will be financially sustainable. We won't depend um, funding from LASH or any donor organization outside Ghana. So we started generating income, generating income so that we can pay the workers, we can also continue some projects that we are doing in the communities and maybe using some of our income to support some of, some of the African countries. So um, where we have reached so far, what I can see is that uh, our income base is going up. And then the fund that we are also getting from LASH is a bit going down. And then uh, what we hope is that uh, very soon, uh, will be financially sustainable. So the dream that I got yeah, about so, uh, setting up. I'll just interrupt us for one minute because I'll tell everybody when we first, so it, was a, it must have been over two years ago when we first came to visit Paul. Um, and 
Uh, we'd only given him a small amount of money at that point for us. I think it was, yeah, about £10,000. So it's enough, but it wasn't, you know, it's not millions. And, um, and we, we wanted to see some of the projects, and we were expecting to see a project. And when we got there, we were flat out busy for about four days seeing every single project. So each one of those he's just talked you through, he'd had that up and running within months of us giving the money to him. And as he said, we didn't put a big constraint on what he could spend the money on. We trusted that it would be the right thing. Obviously, trust is one of those things where, well, let's hope it's all right. And we were just blown away with what he'd, what he'd achieved with that money in such a short space of time. He was growing mushrooms. He was growing moringa. He had a tree nursery, had a women's micro loan. Several and, tree nurseries. Yeah, several tree nurseries. We didn't, I don't think we saw all of them in the end, did we? But there were millions of trees in a, in a country that is very high up on the list for deforestation. Um, and we saw it was just unbelievable. And for me... I was, uh, you know, I was not, I hadn't seen a permaculture project in action. And when we got there, I was 100% sold. Uh, he showed us basically land where on the left-hand side, they had cassava planted, like a yam um, that was growing. Uh, exposed to the sunlight, the soil was all baked. Um, and it burned it beforehand. Yeah, and so, and then on the right-hand side was the same amount of cassava, but there was moringa trees planted, banana, um, black pepper. There was just like tons and tons of different things that you could eat, consume, sell, whatever it might be, on a small plot of land. And it was infinitely more, um, you know, better for the, the local environment. It didn't use any harmful pesticides. And I was just, I th you know, when it, you can't work out if it makes sense. You're like, but this is what everyone tells you to do. Cut everything down and plant stuff. And you're like, no, no. Let everything grow, and then you'll have more. And you're like, oh, okay. And you could see it literally physically. You could see it with your own two eyes. And I think that's, you know, that's the incredible thing about it. So sorry to interrupt. I just want to say. Thank you. So um, uh, as I said, uh, we, we, I started with a permaculture network. So when I started getting the slash fund, we got a land, which is 24.5 acres, where we set up um, Ghana Permaculture Institute. So I got the money from Slash Fund and then we bought the land. Paul, can you just tell us about the land as it was when you bought it? Because that's quite interesting. Um, the land that I, that I bought, it was a um, gravel winning area where they were winning gravels over there for the road construction. So um, uh, when I approached the chief to buy the land, they told me that oh, this is a bad land. And then what are you going to use the land for? Are you going to use the land for gold mining? And I said, no. But um, I'm going to use it to, um, uh, for permaculture demonstration farm. So they said, this land is not good. Don't buy it. And I said, I need it. I'll buy it. <laughs> so later, um, the chief gave the land to me. And then um, the whole process about the land, the documentation moves very fast. Because when you go to the Lands Commission in Ghana, it can take you one year to get all your documents. But ours, it took us um, one month. It took us one month to get all the documents set up. So we set up the um, GPI. So the GPI, we, we decided to get um, um, a base camp. So Paulo told me that, uh, why not rather than um, using local materials for the base camp? So that is the base camp that we can see on the screen. Um, the roofing ties and then um, the bricks are just molded from the soil over there. The plastering is a cow down, ash, and also some local plant in the bush. And then uh, we have a solar panels where you can charge your mobile phone, your computer, and then uh, there's a small, conference, uh, a small conference hall in the middle. So... Uh, we built the base camp, and then also we used some of the fund to buy a pickup. Um, and then these are some of, the, some of the pictures, the pickup. And then that is um, three, three of my kids. And then uh, we have a dam where all the runoff water, we are catching all the runoff water and store over there for a small irrigation and also for aquaculture, where we raise some fishes inside. 
but the fishes that we rear is polyculture. We have the catfish, and then we have also the 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 the, 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 um, the, the mud fish and then other fishes mixed together in the same um, uh, pond. And then we have a, a straw hat, and then uh, we are also um, we demonstrated um, whisker ties. But what we find out in Ghana is that uh, a lot of the organizers, they remove the car ties, people start burning the car ties, and then causing mess into the atmosphere. You see pollution everywhere. They are burning the car ties. So we said, this is very simple, because looking at the permaculture, we said the field lies open to the interact. So let's create a model. Let's come up with a design where we can use the waste cast ties for a very good resources. So we pick the car ties, and then we build a nice house. And then, you know, when people were passing by, they said, oh, look at what the white men are doing over there. And I will ask them, that, am, I, am I a white man? They said, <laughs> OK. So what we found out is that uh, people just passing by looking at this building. And then very soon, what we have seen that people are using the car ties for their uh, pig star, and then also for their chicken coop. And then people are now using it as a resource now. And also, we have the Moringa factory. Because um, the Moringa um, Lash is trying to, I think Lash has just started buying the Moringa oil from um, uh, GPI. But um, we were having a problem of um, some simple machines that we can use to process it. Because after processing the moringa and then um, getting the oil, we can use the cake as animal feed. We can use the cake to purify water. We can use the cake as organic fertilizer. And then the shell of the moringa, we can also use it also as organic fertilizer. So we, we thought that, oh, then why not build in the factory? And then Lash said, oh, we'll give you another funding to build a factory and then having some solar dryers so that uh, we can process the moringa just to cut down the cost so that large can buy and then the farmers can get a lot of income. So the GPI, we have an apiary where we rear bees. This is a natural vegetation. So we, are see, we are want to see how we can incorporate other projects into the natural vegetation. And then uh, we can rear bees there. And then we can also grow some shade-loving plants, like um, um, black pepper. We can raise snails under the natural vegetation. This is what we call ecological farming. So we just maintain the natural vegetation, and then we incorporate some other projects which can match with the natural vegetation, which is very, very sustainable, maintaining the greening, and also improving the soil fertility, and also um, uh, getting some of the medicinal plants and also the habitat, the animal habitat. So we have this design at the GPI now. And also where the, the soil was very degraded, where they were winning the gravel, um, we decided growing the moringa and also other annual crops like cucumber and the, um, carrots and then other things. And then we also harvest the moringa and also sell the leaves and then sell the powder and then use the Moringa leaves as a soil improvement. Uh -huh. And uh, we also started working on the Citronera because um, Lash told me, Agnes, and then Gabi, Simon, Polo said, oh, we need Citronera. So if you can grow Citronera, you can produce essential oil, and then Lash can buy. One thing I'm interested over here is that um, um, we are trying to see how a, a farmer in Ghana, a, a, a grassroots farmer in Ghana, will increase his or her income base. Uh, what we have seen is that, uh, like, like say, a farmer can be getting income every month or even two weeks. And if a farmer is getting income, like, say, every month, every month, every month, every month, then what I would say is that, uh, the farmer will be a bit okay. Because when we look at the crops that we grow in Ghana, it takes like um, three months before you can reap from what we have just sown. 
by looking at the period of um, three months, ask yourself, what is the farmer going to eat within the period of three months? Because the farmer will make some expenses within that three months, and then before he harvested his crops, then there is a, a debt ahead of him. How is he going to pay it? But if a farmer is getting income like every month, every month, every month, and then let's say every month the farmer is getting like 300 Ghana cities, the farmer can spend 200 and save 100 Ghana cities, and then the farmer is safe over there because he has been getting income, putting money into, into his or her pocket. This is what we are looking for, so that the grassroots farmer can also boast of him or herself about the farming work that he's doing. And what is interesting, so there is citronella, and I think you've got another couple of slides. There's also lemongrass and vetiver. Uh, what's interesting about those as well is, obviously, we use the essential oils from those plants. And the interest in this is that the farmers can still have their uh, food crops, so there is food security, but all these can be cash crops, so they can harvest vetiver, um, lemongrass, citronella, we can actually distill it on site, produce the essential oil, and that will give an income to the farmers, apart from just having some food security, they will also have some cash that they need to send their kids to school to do whatever they need to do. So that's the next stage, and we're really quite excited about that as well. Yes, because we've used the Moringa in from dusk till dawn earlier this year, and with some of the slush projects, we'll start working with people with a specific material in mind, perhaps, in a region. But with this one, it was working with a specific person and then figuring out what it was that they could produce in that area that we could incorporate. Um, so looking at um, this project, uh, what Ghana we have just found out is that um, um, we can still grow the citronella, lemongrass, uh, vetiver under our plantation crops. Because as we are practicing permaculture, uh, we can go into polyculture system. So if a farmer is intercropping his um, plantation crops with these um, uh, essential oil plants, then the farmer is reducing weeding, weeding cost. And if, let's say, a farmer spent like, uh, say, maybe 100 Ghana cities on one acre farm, um, and then the farmer, if the farmer is intercropping, it's not like maybe having one acre farm for citronella and another acre farm for uh, plantation crops because you have all the crops in the same piece of land. So you can reduce labor costs and then increase your income base. So the farmers are very interested of um, practicing this system. And you don't need to use chemicals with our system. When you have monocultures, fields of just one thing, it's much more vulnerable to pests and disease and it needs fertilizing. But when you grow all of these things together with some plants included that also help to self-fertilize the soil like a forest does, nobody puts fertilizer in a forest, right? Suddenly they're not having to spend their money on all of these chemical inputs. They're much healthier because they don't have these toxic chemicals around. And at the same time, the system is much more healthy and productive and they get more out and more consistently throughout the year, as Paul was saying. You don't just get one or two crops a year. You're cropping every week or two. Yeah, and also um, what we have seen is that uh, we want the farmers to know is that uh, they shouldn't depend upon government because the government cannot solve their problem for them. Because what we have seen in Ghana is that uh, government is pushing chemicals, pushing fertilizer to the farmers. We will give fertilizer to you on credit. We will give chemicals to you on credit. And people are spraying chemicals on the farm where they are not protected. And you see very soon, you see some people dying. You see some chemicals which are bound in Europe. You just find them in Africa. But the farmers are using it. You see chemicals that we use to store our food. They don't know the precautions about it. They store the food, they give it to school people, and then you see the number of school people dying. But we have some herbs that we can use to store our food. And what we are saying is that uh, if we are very smart about our activities, we can grow our income. And then uh, very soon, 
the government will see what we are doing. Government will see what we are earning in the community. And what we have just found out on the GPI site is that um, now money, more money companies are coming because there is a lot of distraction in Ghana where mining companies are destroying our environment. Because they are um, drilling gold in our water bodies. They are polluting the water. And also somewhere they are also mining gold has just becoming a, a dead trap. There is some, some pits where people can just fall into it. So when they found out that uh, where they were winning gravel for the own construction, we have improved the soil. Now more mining companies are coming to GPI, bringing more farmers to come and learn all these things. But in a permaculture system, uh, we have what we call land reclamation system, where, where, where they have winning the, 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 where they have um, mining the gold. You can level the whole land, and then you can improve the soil using animal manure, using biochar, and also using some nitrogen fizzing crops. When you grow it on the land, like say one year time, you can improve the soil, and then you can grow your crops. So all, a lot of mining companies are coming, coming to look at the permaculture ideology so that maybe they can also practice the same thing. So they want us to set up some demonstration farms at where we have the mining areas. And what we are telling them that if they want to do that, they have to put more money into the GPI project. When they put more money into the project, because we have one mining company from uh, US, that the man is saying that we'll be, we'll, be, we'll be mining gold, but we can't eat gold. By all means, when we mine gold, we we'll eat food. So the, the best way is that uh, as we are mining gold, we have to look at how maybe we can be practicing permaculture as well. So the, the other, just to add to that, I, I know quite a lot about this work that Paul's been doing. It's not that, that, that they are um, kind of getting into bed with the mining company. It's the mining company actually wants to try to do something to stop the negative impacts of what's happening. And gold mining is one of the, one of the main sectors of Ghana's economy. So it's very important to the country. And so um, what this is is an opportunity to try and try and repair the damage that's been done in, in many, many places in it and improve the land again so that it can be used again. So it's, it's repair work. And this is something that permaculture can offer. It can take very badly degraded land and turn it back into abundantly productive land over a very short period of time. And this is why Paul chose the site for GPI to do that. So you could take, there's, there's an area of GPI that looked like moon rock when I saw it when we first got there. There was no soil at all, just this red rock. And now it's full of, full of growing food. And I think for me, if you don't mind, Paul, we might have to leave it there and we can move on to the other projects as well. Okay. But um, the work that you're doing there, basically proving to people that you can not only have... So from our perspective, in a buying perspective, we always took the as little damage as possible. You know, how, much, you know, how can we reduce our environmental impact how can you reduce your carbon footprint? How can you reduce? What this is doing is putting all that to one side and saying, how can you regenerate? So how can you take an area of land that was only fit for road building and mining on and then actually start to grow food on it? How can you actually bring back the environment that we're seeing sort of tip over the, the brink? How are you going to be able to bring that back? And with a lot of these permaculture techniques, that's exactly what's happening. So it's about, it, it sounds strange, but, you know, building soil doesn't sound like a big deal, but in Africa, it's one of the number one reasons why we're seeing land erosion and droughts and uh, food shortages is because soil has been eroded through these practices that we're talking about, you know, using too many pesticides and overusing the soil. Um, to do that really does dramatically change what we're capable of as human beings, because it means we go from a destructive pattern to something that actually regenerates. The financial succession is basically where we started the funding with GPI, and then that funding starts to drop off and they earn, earn their own money. So that's a quite a key point in the fact that it's a self-sustaining business, and like you say, then it becomes a viral business almost. Um, one of the other really fun things, I don't know if we've got time to smell, is Erica out there with um, Yulang. A few years ago, we invested um, in 60 hectares in Ghana of a Ylang plantation. 
This is before we looked at permaculture and before we met Paul. Paul's since been there and has given us advice on actually how to create more of a permaculture system. But what we've done is um, ylang was never grown in Ghana before. And over the last, um, it must be five years, they've been, um, we've been growing ylang ylang oil in Ghana. And finally... Very excitingly. Very excitedly. The distiller is on its way to Ghana as we speak. So we will also have our own Ilang Ilang uh, oil production as of hopefully next month. So that's another thing that's now. Da, 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 da. It's, um, it's taken us quite a while, but it's another thing that's now underway and we're almost there and it should appear in a lush product near you, hopefully. Yeah, Very we just soon. Have to, yeah, we just have to use it. And, and there's, the, uh, there's the beautiful team from the Ilan lush, yeah. project and Lush, lush Ghana, Ghana team with Paul and, yeah, all beautiful people. Next, we're going to talk about Rosewood. Okay, so this is another uh, exciting project, slush fund project, which we have in Peru. Uh, our friend Limba, who runs the Peru project, unfortunately couldn't get a visa to get here today. Um, so he's not with us. Uh, we would have loved him too. Uh, we uh, have a project in Peru in uh, the rainforest upriver uh, from the nearest town about 16 hours away. In the Amazon. In the Amazon. And uh, we are going to show you a bit, of a, a bit of a film. Yeah, I think we should have a film to show just of what we've been up to. The Lush Peru Rosewood Project is located deep in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest, about 15 hours boat ride from the city of Pucallpa. We travel down the river Ucayali, one of the biggest rivers in Peru which feeds into the Amazon. On the way to the Lush Peru Project, we're lucky enough to see Amazon river dolphins playing. So we're now quite far up river and um, we're on one of these little tiny channels with fallen trees everywhere. And every time we turn around a corner, we startle lots of birds that fly out of the trees. We've seen some beautiful birds. Um, I've seen an eagle circling above us and some diving birds that are like kingfishers that dive under the water when they see us. And um, every now and again we're having to slow down to, uh, to pass fallen trees in the river that have been cut previously to make a little gap for us to squeeze through. Um, the canopy is quite, quite tight, often it's closing up ahead. So how's it going Agnes? It's going fine, I'm just a little bit um, anxious about the uh, trees in the river. Ronaldo and Adler, these guys in the other boat, have gone on ahead of us uh, this morning to clear the clear the way of any fallen uh, fallen branches. They have a chainsaw in their boat, so they they left camp early this morning, um, just, just as it got light, and they've been cutting the, the passageways for us. During the last few couple of weeks, there's been some, some more fallen timber, and also the water level's gone down. We're coming out of the rainy season, so, um, so a lot of the stuff that was floating high has come down and jammed the river channels. It just smells incredible. That's what I love about essentials and stuff, seeing them. I'll take Agnes out of the picture for a sec. Hug that tree. Um, when you smell essential oils in situ or where they're meant to be, it just make, it brings them alive. So to see it, to smell it, you know, while it's actually grown in the uh, Amazon, it's pretty incredible. So we found a big jaguar footprint here and this is much bigger than the other one we found last time we were here. This is an adult one. Agnes, can you put your hand next to it just for some comparison? So you can see the size of that paw print is actually almost as big as Agnes's hand. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really big. So, so that's a big, a big jaguar. So um, here is the first rosewood tree that we've, that we've found walking from the camp and it's been about 10 minutes walk. So when we first started this project um, I was talking to Limba via email and on the phone and uh, when Limba first came here to see this this uh, this area when it was still owned by the logging company 
he said it was very much like Avatar, like the movie Avatar. So just imagine the forest full of these big yellow machines pushing, bulldozing everything down and, and ripping them all down and dragging out these big logs along here to the, to the river. By buying the rights to this concession, what Lush has done is we've stopped that and we're going to um, sustainably manage these trees. So instead of just cutting, cutting, cutting everything, we will extract something but we'll do it in a very gentle manner and we'll replant more than we take and we'll keep the rest of the forest standing. And we've already seen that even after this short time the animals are starting to return. So we've, we've saved this piece of rainforest and hopefully we can return it back to its full, full splendour pretty soon. From their 40 hectare site near the city of Pucallpa, they work with neighbouring indigenous Shipibo Indian communities in an area of badly degraded and deforested land. The region is badly affected by summer fires which get out of control and burn the regenerating forest, resetting nature back to zero each year. Rikova has been cutting and maintaining fire breaks to stop the fires spreading and has been helping their Shipibo neighbours protect and reforest their land. They are also planting new rosewood trees into the regenerating forest which will become part of Lush's future oil supply as well as generate income for local people. So this is a, a rosewood tree that's fallen down and um, it's about between 30 and 40 years old and it's, it's pretty much two tonnes worth of wood and um, so this is currently being chopped up bit by bit and taken back to the camp and distilled and um, it's giving us a very very good quality oil and, and a very high quality uh, high quantity of yield it's giving about 1.7 1.8 kilos per of oil per distiller load which is good normally a chainsaw is used to cut the tree and it is loaded onto a trailer pulled by a small tractor however this time there were so many of us and the road was so bad we decided to cut by hand and carry it back ourselves, without having to carry a heavy chainsaw too. The logs are carried back to the distillation site, where they are then cut into pieces and chipped using a wood chipper. The wood chips are collected into a bag and then weighed. This is so that we know how much oil we are getting out of each kilogram of wood chip. The wood chips are then packed into the distillation unit, into a central perforated tank through which hot steam is passed. The distiller is heated by something called a rocket stove, this is an L-shaped stove made from an old oil drum and an insulating clay mixture inside which directs all of the heat up into contact with the bottom of the distiller. It is very efficient and uses very little firewood. And we have also designed and built one that can be run using the leftover wood chip from the distiller as its fuel. So if you can see, we are using uh, uh, firewood okay. and uh, uh, a smaller firewood and we put in this in, in, in this uh, hole and this other hole is to get the air yeah. so the air comes inside this way and uh, and, and and blow the firewood yeah. and all the fire comes in one direction to to the, the, the stirrer it's very efficient yeah it's very very it efficient burns everything yeah. Yeah, yeah of course wow. Come here. <laughs> wow. Okay, we are inside uh, of the mother house. So uh, in my left we have a blue barrel. So uh, this is a, a small tank that where we put uh, uh, all our oil that we are uh, getting. This is we are collecting in this in this uh, little tank. So, uh, Simon, look at this. Exciting. Oh, wow. That is really strong, wow. isn't it? How amazing is that? That is really nice. Yeah, I find it unbelievable that all of the material used to build this, this house came from the forest and that there were people skilled enough to bring it out to then strip it into planks and build something as beautiful as, as this with it is absolutely unbelievable. Um, in the UK you couldn't even imagine embarking on a project like that really and if you did you'd have a film crew and it'd be on Channel 4. So Simon, how was the trip? Yeah, it was alright. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah, it's been really good. I love going through, this is like going through the Dagobah system. In Star Wars. Yeah, in Star Wars. It's brilliant. No, it's been, everything's been absolutely incredible. 
I've really loved, um, well, I just love how beautiful the, the forest is. You're coming in by boat, it's really you know, adventurous. You keep hitting into branches and logs and all sorts. And then to see how much work. We've got 12 hours, was it 12 hours we're on the boat on the way in? And that's a good day. So to get in all the equipment and then to be bringing back the rosewood in small consignment so we don't get hijacked. It's always good, but well, we've got it there, so we've got uh, 15 kilos have we got, yeah. so um, yeah, so it's all looking really, really good and uh, really good fun as well, I'm enjoying it. So Limba's vision for, for this region of the Amazon is very similar to, to what Paul's is for Ghana, and, and it's, it's about trying to change these destructive cycles of um, spirals of degradation of the forest and social degradation of the communities um, and these cycles of environmental degradation and poverty that go together and to try and find ways to, to break that cycle and come out of it. And we didn't say in the film, but that logging concession that Lush has bought is 6,000 hectares, which is quite big. Um, from, the, from the river, which is the main road in, it's the only way in really, um, it's something like 34 kilometers to the end of the concession. So basically, Lush have the rights to do any kind of logging activity sustainably there uh, in something that is beyond the size that we could imagine. We were walking around for about three or four hours, and we probably covered one tiny little section of it. It's dense jungle, um, and it's absolutely beautiful. And it's incredible to think that we can take oil from there sustainably, use it in our products, um, and also protect the forest at the same time. So it's almost unheard of, really. One of the reasons it's so precious is because rosewood is, is an endangered species. Because traditionally what people have done is they've just cut the trees down, killed them, and chipped everything. For this project, what we're doing is we're cutting the trees very high and letting them regrow. And we'll just be pruning the branches on a 20-year cycle. And to do this, we had to get Limba had to go to Lima, the capital, and get a whole new piece of um, forestry law written for Peru because nobody has ever done this before in Peru or anywhere. So when we're, when we're talking about um, pioneering, uh, we really felt like this was, you know, again, was a project that did that. The fact that they took their own sawmill up uh, 16 hours up into the Amazon on a small boat the size that you saw. Uh, then they cut their own planks of wood and built that, that distillation, uh, you know, way, the, the large building that we were in, the mother, what do you call it? The mother, mother, mother house. house. They built the mother house from wood, just literally outside there. From They're trees that the loggers had left yeah. lying on the floor. So they didn't and they the also trees. got a distillation vessel there. They got water tanks. They got everything that they needed, they took there. And when we were there, they were asking for um, also a GPS kind of radio phone, a radio phone to phone back because it's so far away. Um, we were discussing how much that would cost. And um, it kind of brought it home how exposed you are out there because a lot of the local communities are quite aggressive against um, white people and in actual fact over the Christmas um, period so there was two trips to Peru that you saw there into Splice the first time and yes in Paolo went and then we came back after Christmas uh, a second time to see how the progress was going and during that period of time over Christmas they deserted the place to go home for holidays when they came back somebody had come through from one of the local villages and had left a message on, uh, he'd stolen, whoever it was had stolen a few bits and left a message saying, hey gringo, um, basically, if you don't watch out, you're going to end up sucking a bullet. So we realized then that they probably do need to have a phone out there just in case it gets a bit ropey. And also that we've got a lot of work to do in, in terms of the people care aspect of that project, which Limber is an expert. He's also um, Shipibo, um, which is the indigenous people, but he hasn't worked in that area before, but you can see when we're talking about um, pioneering and, uh, you know, there it is quite dodgy as well. And this has been done now, so Limbo actually organised for all the local communities, the Shipibo communities, to actually come to the concession, to see the distillation, to understand what we were doing there, so that nobody is worried about our activities there. Basically, they, uh, the local population has had a lot of bad experiences with white people coming in, mining the land, logging illegally, etc. And that is why we got the death threats. But now... It wasn't um, a death threat. 
It was a friend. He said it was, it was friendly. Uh, yeah, it was he said it was friendly, Limber, didn't he? He said he's just yeah. joking, but it's, I'm going to go and have a chat with him. Yeah. So anyway, now all, all that all that work of you know communication with the local population has been done, and we have no problems with going back. And I, I just say one thing as well. The the little snippet in the middle of the film um, with the with the burnt land. That's the other project that Limba runs, which is called the Rainforest Ecoversity Centre, which is nearer to town, and this is very similar to GPI that, that Paul's doing. It's regenerating degraded rainforest, and it's working with the surrounding communities. So what we've done is we've got some of the people from the communities around the Rosewood site, and we've paid for them to go to the Rainforest Ecoversity Centre for permaculture training and to learn more about how to do this so that we're building bridges with these communities and we're trying to help them to develop new sustainable income generating strategies for their communities. But yeah, it's a lot of fun doing this, but as Lee said at the beginning, it's pretty high risk. Um, and what you've seen so far, I mean, we're going to have to wrap it up a little bit um, sharpish, I think, but it'd be nice to maybe overrun slightly so we can show you... Um, kind of up and coming projects as well and also tell you a little bit about so we've we've focused on two of our main projects which have we've spent a lot of time energy and money on but also we've supported a lot of other things through slush so with that um 800,000 pounds um this is only two of what we've done Kenya was another one and just maybe a brief overview of what we've been doing in Kenya so again we um we went uh, a few weeks ago and the project there is supporting uh, an, another uh, permaculturist in Kenya who is doing some excellent, amazing work. Uh, he is also growing some geranium at the moment for us. And again, this, this should be a very, uh, very quick turnover project. The crop of geranium is in July. The distiller has been ordered and it's on its way. So also from July, we should be able to distill some of our own Geranium oil, so that will be another one that we will have. Um, this is quite a recent project that we, we're developing. So we funded um, 50,000 50, geranium seedlings as an experimental phase. Um, and we went back um, last month, wasn't it? Yeah to have a look and it's doing really well. So it's intercropped between um, other food crops. So yeah, beans, uh, potatoes, carrots. So um, in, in Kenya, I think food security is not really an issue in this area. So as you can see in, the, um, in one of the lower um, photos, so um, they were actually feeding the carrots to the cattle. So they have surplus of it. So a lot of these um, conventional agriculture um, businesses have come in and they've said, oh, we've got a market for, um, for carrots, potatoes, um, for, for Europe, basically. So um, all these farmers have cut down all their crops and planted all these, but because everyone's joining in on this now, um, they've got surplus, they don't have a market for it. So this geranium oil, um, if flush when we buy it, I think it's going to make a real difference. So it's, yeah. it's going to be, basically, the, the, it's what we mentioned before, there's that aspect of cash crop. So they have food security, they have plenty of food, but now what they need is an income from yeah. some things, from something else. The geranium can grow alongside the food crops and it will generate uh, an, an income. There are three crops, three possible crops a year in Kenya. Um, so that, that will be something which, again, will give them a bit more um, income security. And one of the, the most impressive things for me personally was when we were there meeting the farmers and having them explain their willingness to learn. They really wanted to learn all these skills that Peter has been teaching for 10 years in the area and how keen they were to be able to set up a system where they were moving away from the pesticides, moving away from the chemicals. And it was just this genuine sense of hope and excitement. And it was incredibly inspirational. Why didn't they, why didn't they want to use? What they'd found is that they were actually realizing that the chemicals and pesticides were starting to make them ill and 
they were becoming more and more aware of it. And also, they didn't want to eat the food that had been sprayed with a pesticide. So they were growing it in the hope they could sell it. But they didn't personally really feel comfortable eating it. They were worried about it. It was expensive as well. And for most of these farmers, it was the first time that they'll be growing anything organically and that they were learning about the pest man integrated pest management systems. And, and th this is why it's so important to have this element in the core of, of, of a lot of the slush projects that's about training. It's about supporting organizations like GPI, like MOOF in Ghana, and to be able to um, serve this rural population that has had 60 years of bad farming advice from Western chemical companies. I think as well, what was really impressive is that Peter had thought really carefully about what was lacking in the local people's diet. So he intercropped different things. I mean, there's a lack of, di lack of diversity in general. So they're really suffering with the nutrition of, in their diets as well. So he'd thought really carefully, carefully about what to inter intercrop between the geraniums. So. so we'll just maybe summarize, because I know we've overrun it slightly. But um, we have supported other organizations. Another nice one in Kenya is Otepic. Um, which have done some really good work in terms of just training and setting up facilities 7, for... 7,000 farmers. Yeah, 7,000. I mean, it's just the reach of some of these centres that uh, we have funded has been incredible as well. Um, there's a map here that shows the diversity of the different projects we've been working on, um, and we're working on that actually being available for everyone to look at with funding information and how much we spent and, and on what... And then we've, these are other projects where we have obviously ongoing commitments or um, we're hoping in the future that we will also be working with these people. A lot of the projects you're seeing there, so Peace Community, obviously, um, the Peace Community in Colombia, um, we already work with. Um, there's a lady in Congo called Lua, who we've been supporting for the last um, probably a year or two years, who's, um, yeah, who's doing some great work there. She's working with pygmies who have been displaced, um, and uh, she's working training with them on permaculture and also just finding places to live because they've been moved. Um, we're hoping that in the future, a few of these projects at the moment, their focus is on basically hand-to-mouth, making sure they've got food for themselves, that they're set up, and that they can actually provide for the local community. After a, after a period of time, we'd really like to be working with them in the longer term, maybe we can get some ingredients from them and provide some economic su support as well. And, and they want to do that as well. Yeah. So. so that's part of a longer term vision. Obviously, that takes a bit of time. Um, so what we've, we've got is kind of different projects at different stages coming to fruition. Um, so really, you're going to see more and more of these kind of essential oils and materials appearing in your products um, uh, with this kind of added benefit. And it's a huge added benefit. Um, kind of in the summary, really, I thank everybody for their contribution. I really thank Paul for coming over as well because it's a real honour to have him here um, and his work was an inspiration. <laughs> and I, th I think really what I'm trying to give you a glimpse of is that new model to replace the old, one where we're actually regenerating and providing income and providing materials for ourselves and everybody can maybe end up happy and I think that's where we're where we really want to be heading so I'm very positive about it and I really appreciate everybody's put their time and effort in it it really relies on us generating enough money to support everybody and it relies on people such as Paul who are passionate and and skilled at the other end of that and there's a whole connection in between. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank and, you. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>